Hi everyone, uh, my last two videos focused on a concept that's generally called Panzer 46. What would happen if the Second World War had gone for maybe a couple of months, maybe a year or so longer? Uh, what kind of armored vehicles would have would we see on the battlefield in, um, in that scenario? Uh, my first video focused on German vehicles uh, and then a couple of subsequent ones focused on Soviet vehicles, but up until this point, I've hardly mentioned the Western Allies at all. Well, it's time to change that. Uh, this video is going to talk about start talking about the Americans, uh, more specifically the Pershing tank. So the Americans are a very interesting state. Uh, the Pershing had actually seen battle. So while the Centurion only showed up on the battlefield uh, after Germany surrendered, and the IS-3 only showed up as a part of the September uh, parade in Berlin, the Pershing actually reached the front lines during the winter of 1945, and even though only a couple of them had actually gotten to any fighting, uh, we can still take the experience the Americans had and make some reasonable assumptions about what a Pershing tank would have looked like in 1946. But let's start at the beginning. Uh, the Pershing program, or rather what became the Pershing program, started all the way back in April of 1942, uh, pretty much just as the Sherman tank was rolling, off, the first Sherman tanks were rolling off the assembly lines. This isn't uncommon. Very frequently, you start working on a replacement for a tank as soon as it enters production. That was the case with the medium tank M3, and that's what turned into the medium tank M4 or Sherman. Um, but now that the Americans had a satisfactory medium tank in production, they could take slightly longer to develop its replacement. Um, and boy, did they have a wide number of options. I'm not going to go over the entire T20 series, um, I'm going to start in October of 1942, when a proposal to make a tank called T-25 and T-26 was made. Um, the difference was that these tanks would carry a 90mm gun. Uh, this was, of course, more powerful than a 75mm gun used on the Sherman. And a 76mm gun that would have been used on the T-20, um, T-20, T-22 and T-23 tanks. Uh, now, this was not a reaction to the Tiger. The, nobody knew anything about the Tiger at that point. Uh, but what was a reaction to the Tiger is the request for more armor. Uh, the T-26 was actually defined in April of 1943 as having equivalent or superior armor to that of the German Mark VI tank, which is what the Americans called the Tiger. Uh, and now this tank with firepower and armor equivalent or superior to the Tiger was going to weigh two-thirds of the weight, only 36 tons, which is a pretty optimistic estimate, but still it would have been a very, very uh, light tank for the amount of armor and firepower that it had. And of course, 36 tons is still a medium tank. The T-23 tank, which originally was supposed to weigh 30 tons uh, without the firepower upgrade or additional armor, ended up weighing 34 tons. Uh, the T-26, which was supposed to weigh 36 tons, would have, by that metric, ended up weighing about 40 tons. Uh, now the Americans considered that to be excessive, and so they started scrapping uh, features of this platform, namely the very progressive but also very heavy electric transmission. Uh, and the alternative was a T-26E1 tank, which ended up weighing 38 tons. So higher than estimated, but not that much higher. The pilot batch of 10 T-26E1 tanks was built, and they were tested throughout the summer of 1944. Um, and, well, when you have a new revolutionary tank, with a lot of new components, you are going to discover defects. Uh, there were defects in pretty much every part of the tank, from the ammo racks to the, the engine to the running gear, uh, and they needed to be corrected. Uh, they needed to be corrected so urgently that a request was made to send components directly to the proving grounds to be installed there, as opposed to installing them at the factory. Now, unfortunately, uh, as with any tank, proving something's the toughness of something means making it thicker which is making it heavier. And so the 38-ton tank very quickly swelled into a 42-ton tank. Now, at this point, you can't really claim that a 42-ton tank as a medium it might be fine for Germans, but most other nations were a little bit more careful about their weight classifications. And so the, heavy uh, the medium tank T-26E1 became the heavy tank T-26E1.
Now, it might sound like the T26 program was in trouble, but eh, not really. Uh, the T26 E1 was being tested, it was being improved. Meanwhile, the T25 and T25 E1 were cancelled entirely, and the vehicles that had been built were delegated to be used for spares for the T26 E1. So it was... It had its troubles, but it was the most promising tank the Americans had at the time. The T-26 E-1 continued to improve, and much like the ship of Theseus, eventually turned into a completely different tank. Uh, this tank was designated T-26 E-3. Now, the T-26 E-3 was considered to be a pretty good tank, uh, and the army showed its confidence by ordering 250 units. The prototypes, or rather pilot tanks, were built in November of 1944 and entered trials in December of 1944, these trials continued on until the summer of 1945. They revealed some interesting information about the design, but uh, we'll get to that later. The most important thing is that General Gladian Barnes, uh, who was a key figure in American tank building, uh, he wasn't content with only testing a tank in the proving grounds. He considered it important to test it in the field, uh, and since, well, Germany was on its last legs, it was important to get this tank into the field as quickly as possible. So he took 20 of the first 40 tanks that were produced and had them shipped to northwestern Europe to fight the Germans. So these tanks arrived in Europe as a part of what was called the Zebra Mission in January of 1945. Now, getting the description of the Zebra Mission is probably best reserved for a separate video, but suffice it to say, even though there were only 20 tanks um, delivered and issued, they still had made quite an impression on American troops um, and American senior officers, uh, enough to get an idea of how to move forward in the T-26 program. Uh, while the tank was in Europe, it was actually standardized, so the T-26 E3 became the heavy tank M-26, uh, nicknamed General Pershing. As it often happens, the end users had very different opinions about General Pershing. Uh, the senior officers really quite liked it. They liked that it was considerably lighter than German heavy tanks. They considered its firepower and its armor to be sufficient. Uh, and they wanted a lot more of them. The end users, the commanders, the NCOs actually operating the tank had a slightly different idea. To them, the upgraded armor was not enough. The upgraded firepower was not enough. Uh, they needed a bigger gun, thicker armor. Interestingly enough, they wanted a bigger gun, but they also complained that the length of the barrel was excessive um, and flipping buildings and trees and various other uh, obstructions, but I don't know how they wanted a more powerful gun without a larger barrel. But I digress. Uh, there was, as you can see, this sort of mix of opinions regarding the Pershing tank when it was uh, finally used in the front lines. Interestingly enough, the frontline troops weren't the only ones who had the idea of equipping the Pershing tank with a thicker armor or a more powerful gun. Let's start with the armor. Uh, the armor of the original Pershing tank was developed to fight against the Tiger tank, so it was reasonably resistant against the Tiger's 88mm gun. However, the Germans weren't sitting still either, uh, and they had developed the 88mm Puck 43, which penetrated more armor. Uh, and so a more armored Pershing tank was developed to counter that. Um, this tank was designated T26E5, and it had up to an 11-inch thick gun mantlet, 8-inch thick front, uh, at sloped areas, it was only 6 inches, uh, but that still offered fairly impressive protection, even against the latest and greatest German guns. The weight of this tank had increased considerably to 46.5 tons, but uh, some would think that was a small price to pay for the amount of protection that it offered, especially since German heavy tanks still weighed considerably more. Uh, trials in the summer of 1945 revealed that was not exactly the case. The extra weight had... Uh, very negatively impacted reliability, very negatively impacted the mobility of this tank, and, well, the trade-off just wasn't worth it. Uh, and so the T-26 E-5 program was closed. Um, there was work on a heavy tank on the Pershing, well, loosely based on Pershing components, uh, the heavy tank T-32, but that um, is probably a topic for a different video. So the other object of interest was the gun, and again, he might have been some inspiration from the 48mm uh, Puck 43, uh, or the Tiger, uh, the equivalent used on the King Tiger. Uh, so the 90mm M3 tank on the Pershing was based on the M3 anti-aircraft gun, which had ballistics sort of similar to the Tiger's gun. Um, that was not considered enough to fight the latest threats that came from Germany, and so 
and hence made a bigger gun. Uh, this higher velocity 90 millimeter gun was designated T-15. It could fit into the Pershing turret, but there was one significant flaw. The ammunition, as well as the gun, was longer, heavier, and there was actually not enough room in the turret to easily work with it. And so an improved version of this gun was made called T-15E2. Uh, it was installed in the tank that can't be known as a Super Pershing. Uh, you can kind of see the extra balancing mechanism. Uh, production versions of the Super Pershing did not have the balancing mechanism, uh, the external one, at least um, more elegant setup. But as with the extra armor, it turned out that having a larger gun on the Pershing is not really worth it. Uh, it was too big, too heavy, it clipped terrain when you were driving around, and, well, it turns out that the 90mm M3 was good enough for dealing with the majority of the threats on the battlefield anyway. Um, if you wanted to destroy something that was really big and heavy, well, you can just get a heavy tank, which did not have to be as uh, ubiquitous. Now, it took the Americans quite a while to give up on the idea of this powerful 90mm gun, uh, work on the T-54, which was an improved version of the T-15 gun, went all the way until 1949, but ultimately it was concluded that the Pershing and its descendant can keep the uh, shorter 90mm gun that it was originally built with. Now, this didn't mean that absolutely no improvement was done to the Pershing's armament. Uh, one of the biggest problems with the armament, more so than any perceived shortage in penetration, was the amount of fumes that were made by firing the gun. Uh, this actually had a very negative impact on the practical rate of fire and the practical combat performance of the tank. Uh, it was revealed pretty early on in the testing of the T-26E1 even, uh, but moving the extractor fan all over the hull and the turret really didn't have any positive effect. The thing that did have the positive effect was a fume extractor mounted on the M3A1 gun, which was installed in the medium tank. By that point, it had been downgraded back from a heavy into a medium. Uh, the medium tank M26A1, which is a lot of post-war Pershings, uh, are visibly different from uh, earlier ones because of this feature. Another significant issue was the horsepower. Uh, the Pershing came originally with a 500 horsepower JF engine, uh, which was really not enough to move around a 42-ton tank at any kind of decent speed. Work on an improved engine began as early as 1946, um, and, well, in that year, a prototype of the AV-1790-1 engine, so an 110 horsepower engine, was installed in the Pershing tank. Uh, this engine proved itself quite well, and an improved version, the 1790-3, was later installed in not the Pershing, but its successor. Because as with the T26E1, so many upgrades were made to the design that it essentially became a new tank. This, this tank was designated medium tank T40 and eventually standardized as the medium tank M46 or Patton. Now, it took a couple of years for the Pershing to realize its true potential and turn into the Patton. Uh, but, of course, that was because after the end of the war, uh, financing for tank development goes down. People's interest in tank development goes down. Uh, the Americans, in this case, took a number of years to step back and really figure out what it is they wanted from their tank forces in general. Um, and, well, that, of course, results in delays, uh, since there's no longer a rush to get an upgraded model out there really, really quickly. Uh, but is it fair to say that the Americans would have had a patent tank in 1946 had there not been any cause for a delay? Probably not. Uh, however, looking at the performance of the Pershing tank in the spring of 1945 and looking at all of the upgrades that the Americans tested and eventually accepted or rejected, we can actually come to the conclusion that the Pershing was quite good and quite competitive. Uh, all of the core features like its firepower, its armor were perfectly fine um, and subsequent post-war work focused on less critical issues that weren't solved before it, it entered mass production. So even if the Americans wouldn't be using patents in 1946, I think we can definitely conclude that they would have had a very high amount of Pershing tanks that would have gotten over their initial teething troubles and turned into a very effective tank available in large numbers to fight German heavy tanks as equals.